So I'm going to be able to record today. I know that last week I was not here. I wasn't able to be here and that the recording did not work. It's working now, so it's excellent. Um, so we are gonna go through FAPE um, responsibility when that starts. We're going to go through child find referrals this summer and clarify that for you. We're going to review MOUs. And we looked at um, questions that were brought to our attention last time. And then we're gonna talk about next steps. And hopefully we can do that in about 40 minutes. Um, and I will be sharing a document with you now and I will send this to you around the course. You can now see your screen. There's my DocuSign. You don't want to see that. Okay. And Sandy, I think you need to mute your computer. Sorry. Good. Get it? Okay. All right, so um, one of the things I wanted to um, let you know is that the FAPE obligation for you, you, the, the cohort one, is going to start the first day of your school year, 2024, first day of your school year, not the first day they start attending, because I know that they're staggered attendance but the first day of the school year is when the FAPE obligation is going to shift, okay? So there were some questions about child find this summer. And in CDS, there has been, um, because referrals that come after July 1st actually fall within your school year, um, they have historically been done this, if, there's, if there's an evaluation that comes in, if we can find somebody at the SAU to communicate with, likely we can. We um, try to um, provide that referral to you. Uh, we are going to clarify this even more though, okay, so that it's really clear what everybody's role is. You can see we have, um, starting in the fall on this chart, that we have a CDS SAU um, obligation. In the fall of 2024, the SAU will be responsible for FAPE. But CDS, um, in our minimum requirement for our MOU for you and CDS, we have child find and referrals from Part C. Those are two things that are going to be addressed in every MOU so that everybody has a very clear understanding of who is doing what. So to look at child find, we've broken that down in this far left column into four steps. One of the steps involves screening. And I say that some places screen and some places don't screen. And we know that referral does not require screening in order to occur. So um, we have screening there because sometimes in preschool settings, they do perform screenings and sometimes CDS gets referrals from those screenings. Uh, but that's kind of an optional thing. I should probably put a little asterisk there saying screening's optional. So then we receive the referral. The, um, whoever receives the referral receives a referral. Then you go to evaluation and then you go to the initial IEP meeting. I should put when you receive the referral, you have a referral meeting. I'm changing this in real time, guys. Okay, so you have the receive the referral and you go to a referral meeting. Let's even call that a separate step. Sorry about that. Um, oh gosh. Um, so the referral meeting happens, then the evaluation happens, then the initial IP meeting. So we've broken it down, and mm -hmm. at a minimum, someone's going to be receiving a referral. So these are the five things that you're going to address in your MOU in regard to who do, does what. Now CDS is responsible for these kids until the beginning of next school year, okay? So CDS after July 1, actually I'm just gonna say CDS starting now because July 1 is in two weeks, will inform the SAU when a referral comes in after July 1. 
Uh, they're going to inform the SAU that a referral has come in. And the SAU, as you're part of this, is going to identify a person who can commit funds over the summer to participate in the referral process. So um, you have a referral that's come in in the summer. And again, summer referrals slower than in the fall, right? But they do sometimes stagger in. And so you would be having to commit at least one person who um, can commit funds to attend and be involved in that referral process. And then CDS is going to provide all of the staff to participate at that referral meeting. So if there's a general education teacher, that person is going to be there. If there's um, related service providers, whoever it is that's at that meeting, CDS is gonna provide that staff. And this is over the summer and um, you will send one person. And then if for some reason, because we are preparing some communication for you to be providing for families in your area, if for some reason you get a referral, you're going to, this summer only, give that referral to CDS. And then we're going to follow, the CDS is going to be handling this referral. Now in your MOU, I think many of you are like, uh, you know, are thinking that you want to be involved more right now. Perhaps you want to get your, maybe you're one of these lucky SAUs that has a school psychologist that works in the summer or is willing to work in the summer for additional funds, and you want to get your staff involved. That's clearly possible, but the expense for everything is on CDS at that point, okay? I'm going to talk more about evaluations later, but this, um, we have to know who's doing what out of these five processes. So if you want CDS to do everything, that's fine. This summer, you will have to have someone at the referral meeting and at the initial IET meeting for um, those children. Yes, Megan. I'm just gonna restate what I think I just heard you say. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at that first column for summer 2024, the distinction is if the referral comes to CDS, then CDS informs the SAU. SAU needs to provide that person who has uh, the capacity to commit funds. Um, CDS will put, provide everybody else. If the referral goes to the SAU directly, SAU communicates that to CDS. Have yes. I, okay, um, that's great. It would be helpful maybe to just do a, a quick distinction in the, that column or in that cell to say, Referral to CDS, referral to C CDS, referral to SAU. So many abbreviations. Okay. Um, when you can see moving forward to the summer of 2025, it says CDS and SAU. Um, that's because in your MOU, you're going to help us understand what you may want CDS to do. Maybe you only want them to receiving the referral and passing it on. Maybe you want them to receive the referral and have a referral meeting. Maybe you want them to go straight through to the initial IEP meeting. Whatever it is, that's gonna be delineated and in your MOU, you're gonna know exactly who is doing what step of this process for you. Yes, go ahead, Beth. I just want to get clarification. So the I heard you say that CDS is covering the cost of referrals and evaluation over the course of the summer. When you say the SAU has to provide a contact, is that uh, like providing representation? Like what? Yes. We, okay. So we're providing representation on behalf of the district so that the decision making is, is shared by us as well, but we're not allocating funds because you said um, to commit funds, but we're not, we're really just the person that's hearing what's happening and has a vested interest at that point. Well, I will say that after July 1, you know, if you're taking on the FAPE obligation, remember that if we sign an evaluation consent after July 1, the due date is after the beginning of the school year, most likely. So that's why you do want to have somebody who understands what your resources are in your SAU, because this is a child who's coming, maybe a child is coming for you. <laughs> it's coming for you, <laughs> coming to you. Sense. Yep, I just was going <laughs> by committing funds, but then hearing that CDS was covering the cost. So that makes sense. Thank you. Yes. CDS will be covering all the costs. If CDS, I had this question from a CDS site director, if CDS um, has comp ed to provide, 
and it goes beyond your FAPE obligation, that's not on you, that's on CDS. So everything is on CDS to this point. And in that particular case, a child transferred to a private school, parent choice, they still get comp ed from CDS. Doesn't matter where they are, they are entitled to that comp ed until the comp ed is provided. All right, so then the next thing that has to be on your MOU is a referral from C. There is some mandated processes that happen in the transition of children from C to B. There is a transition notification, um, and then there are transitions that occur over the summer. So for instance, there are children, any child who has a three-year-old birthday in the summer, is going to be someone who you have to make sure you understand is having a three-year-old birthday. Now I am told, because again, our SAUs have never done the C to B transition, that for most states, when you're considering a summer birthday for a three-year-old, you actually do that transfer meeting at the end of the school year, when you have staff available and when you have representation available. Um, depending on what um, you want CDS to cover in terms of that transition, in terms of that transition meeting, um, again, you would need to commit at least one representative. Now, CDS is going to handle all of the C to B transitions that are occurring over the summer. For and then moving forward, you're going to have an understanding of three-year-olds. But there is a transition notification that occurs when children reach, and anyone in Part C, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's two years and uh, two years and nine months. That might be too late. I feel like it's earlier than that. Anyway, in that second year, in that second year, um, there is a transition notification that has to happen. And one thing I will reiterate is that parents who have children in Part C are not obligated to release information to you, nor are they obligated to um, go through that referral process, just like in a referral to special education, they cannot provide consent for that. But we have to um, provide a transition notice that this child is two years, um, in the beginning of their second birthday so that we can tell you that they are a child who's identified with a disability. And then after that notification, there's a transition conference. And that conference meeting is the transition from C to B. And that would be something that, again, you would need a representative who can commit funds um, to participate in that process. Does that make sense? Beth, you have another question? No, it makes sense. Uh, I have a question if I may. Yeah. Uh, again, Bob Kaler, AOS 98. Um, so just to make sure I understand it, I just have end of the year brain at the moment. So no uh, what you had mentioned, um, if we know a student's turning three in the summer, but what was recommended is having that transition meeting before they're three, like end of the yeah. school year while your staff is there? Yes, okay. that's correct. That's Thank correct. Um, and it, this is not the, the same type of meeting as the, this is not going to be the amount of children transitioning that it, that we're currently having. So this is a small amount of children, but you're going to want to um, make sure that you have like a general education teacher there um, and make sure that someone who can represent and understand the educational setting that the child's going to can participate in that conversation and in that IEP meeting. Written notice is generated and then the um, IEP is created from the IFSP. Thank you. Um, so, and as you can see, starting in the fall, this is, again, you're going to determine what you would like to do. I'm going to break down this bullet a bit further um, so that we have um, just all the steps that occur so that you can see the ages that they occur too, because it's 
during that last year from two to three, that is when um, a lot of activity happens in prepare, preparation for that transition. If a child is over two years, 10 months, 10 and a half months, over two years, 10 and a half months, part C won't accept a referral. The referral will have to go to part B. So just make sure you understand it's there's a two year, 10 and a half month. And again, I'm gonna write these ages into this document before I send it to you so that it's super clear who's doing what and when that happens. Uh, there's also a great, uh, we're working on a visual graphic, which um, we have an example from our partner in Arizona that's really helpful in terms of understanding the timing of all of this. So these two things, referrals from C to B, and child find and these aspects of child find are going to be in your MOU and there's going to be a shared responsibility um, because again, we know that um, for 30 years as CDS, people are used to referring to CDS. So at a minimum, we have to make sure that someone is receiving the referral. CDS has the same timeline that the SAU does in regard to having an IEP meeting 15 days from the um, referral and um, having that initial referral meeting and then um, providing consent and then moving to the, and then it has 60 days for the um, initial IP meeting. Now evaluations, I have a note here on evaluations. So in the summer, CDS is responsible for these evaluations. However, I have heard that folks want to have their, they may have an evaluator, their own speech therapist, their own, whoever wants to do the evaluation. It's your child, you have a trusted person, um, and um, you wanna do that. You can um, do that if you have a person who will do that for you. You can have them, complete, your person complete the evaluation and CDS will um, pay for that person to do the evaluation. Um, and then, Moving forward, you're going to have that as an option on your IEP, uh, on your MOU, which is, do you want CDS to be involved in evaluations? Do you want to discuss those evaluations with CDS, see who has the most availability? Um, so we can, we can do those things, but just in the summer, CDS paying for the evaluation. CDS is paying for everything up until that uh, first day of the school year, 2024 school year. So I put that little asterisk there. You can negotiate who completes or conducts evaluations now um, and any costs will be the responsibility of CDS. So these little bullets down here, um, just again, clarify that the FAPE obligation starts the first day of school, the 2024 school year. I wanna say um, that we, you do not need to use the SYNC data system. You don't need to use it, in fact, I would recommend not using the sync data system. Um, we are, we have an RFP that is in the works to, for CDS to get a different data system because the data system is actually working against compliance with federal and state regulations. It's so cumbersome. And I know those of you who have explored it understand that it's, um, it's not a system that's designed for IEPs, so it's very cumbersome and it's very challenging to use. So we are going to suggest that you not use SYNC um, and that you use your own data system. And we have been having individual conversations with people who have identified potentially an IEP coordinator at this grade level who, um, and like I, I was saying prior to everyone getting on this call that you may provide, uh, you may work with CDS to provide training with them on your tool, or you may have CDS provide documentation to you on a Word document. Um, there's many ways that we can facilitate that, but it makes sense for these kids to be in the data management system that you are already using. We are really, I have been really wanting, and I know special ed directors really want a statewide data solution so that we're all using the same thing. And that's a long-term goal that we have and that the data team has. Um, so that is um, probably not imminent, however. And so um, it would be, I would think, um, a good choice to not use sync. 
if you're really set on using sync, you can, uh, you can use it, but it is very challenging to use. And I know that I've had people express a lot of frustration around trying to use it. You cannot bill main care. You cannot bill main care, but we may ask you your related service providers to provide service logs or if you use a system that creates a service log to provide us with a copy of that service log, because we may bill on your behalf. But you cannot bill for main care right now because the special education services are being provided to you at 100% of their cost. Um, and the, the next step in our process here is for us to meet with each of you individually to develop this MOU to come up with a draft MOU to look at some of these pieces that we know have to be there. And then some of the other options that I've been asking you to consider, we've been asking you to consider on this list of referrals. Um, I am going to recommend that CDS assign one person as the, as the um, main person for communication to kind of streamline that communication. And I know that um, some of you have been meeting with CDS directors um, to kind of have those conversations about, you know, who is, who's, who's doing what. There are an amazing, there's a number of administrative folks in CDS that can support administrative tasks. Um, an important feature of this work will, you for be, will be for you to have oversight of the documentation that's produced to make sure it makes sense in your educational setting or for what you provide. So um, I know that there are questions that remain around what about the child who is attending a childcare outside of my catchment area? And we are working very quickly to address that. We do not have the information for you today, but we should have it um, soon. Um, and so that people understand, you know, what do I do in that scenario? When we have parental placements in CDS, the lines have been blurred because of the fact that we don't have enough educational programming if you offer educational programming and have space in your program, um, that could be your FAPE offer that you provide for someone. And like I said, we're really trying to, because that has been so confusing in CDS, we're really trying to understand what it means to be parentally placed in this group when we're relying a lot on private organizations to provide education. I will also say that um, there's a lot of preschool programming in child care settings. The DOE and DHHS are working on getting some information on how we're going to approve that programming moving forward. But at this point, that program, those programs are evaluated by DHHS and there's a monitoring system to, um, that provides you an understanding of the quality of the program but that preschool education is um, available to, to the children in this, who are attending childcare at this point. Um, they don't have the same certification requirements that the Department of Education has, and, um, but it is, it is probable that a child can attend a childcare that provides some preschool setting and that that can be the FAPE offer during this initial year one of our cohort. Um, so next steps for us are to meet with each of you individually to finalize the MOU. And again, nothing set in stone here because once we actually begin this work and as this is flowing forward, there's going to be um, the necessity for us to meet and make changes and um, look at, you know, if there's anything that we need to address in terms of efficiency and communication. Um, but those conversations are going to start the process of scheduling meetings with you and the CDS site that you're working with to develop the MOU. We're also going to be working on doing some open office hours for specific to your role, superintendent, business manager, special director. That's coming up next Wednesday. 
is Juneteenth. And so we um, are not going to meet next Wednesday. Um, we have, we are not able to work next Wednesday. So um, we are going to though, at, after this meeting, start scheduling those meetings with you and then give you some more information next week around when open office hours might be. And I think I've, other than the question of how do I pay for and what does it look like when a child is attending a child care seven towns away from me, other than that question and um, how much money am I giving a child care in my community to provide the fate obligation? Um, those are questions we can't answer for you today, but hopefully we'll be, um, we've set, spent set some time next week for us to kind of really dig down on those questions that we get you some particular answers so that it's more clear for you how to proceed in those scenarios. Uh, anyone, Megan or Sandy, did I leave anything out? Let me mute so you. Um, no, and if, if we could maybe even stop sharing, that might be helpful just to be able to see humans. Hello. Um, I don't have any additions, but um, certainly want to make sure that we leave time for people to ask questions. That was a pretty fruitful um, part of our meeting last week. Looks like there are some fiscal questions and I don't know that we'll be able to answer those for you tonight, this, this afternoon, I should say. New fund. Um, do we have a sense of um, when we can get some of these uh, questions answered, especially the, the finance ones, or do we want to just tell people by Friday, we'll send you an email with sort of a timeline of when some of the questions can be answered. I'm looking at some of the questions and I realize that the answer may be different depending on the question. I'm also doing some answering now. I don't know if you can't see my answers. I can. Yeah. Nice, Paula. Do you want to uh, elaborate on your answers that you've provided? Happy to. Uh, sure. <laughs> Let's see. Are the codes set in stone? Yeah, I'm sorry, they are set in stone. We have got to be able to separate out the pre-K special ed from the pre-K regular ed because the funding sources are completely separate. And so therefore we need codes in order to do that. So Carter, I'm jealous of the friend that you have with you. Um, so sorry, Kathy, I know it's a lot of work, I get it, but we have no choice. Um, let's see, we have them set for now. Um, they may change and these are just, it may not be a full set of codes that you need, but as we always provide the chart of accounts is what, you know, what we believe you're going to need. And then hopefully you can figure out additional ones you might need from that. But that is, that is available and ready and on our website and uh if you give me a minute i'll put it in the chat um as far as the codes go um let's see what else did i say uh account numbers allotment. oh so the nurses and the additional costs if you know of additional costs already what i've said the last couple times that, that this was brought up is gather that information what you know get it to us as soon as possible so we can review it and we're going to need to figure it out we need to determine is this extra cost already over and above what we're calculating to give you in the first quarter? And if it is, we will see what we can do about making an adjustment prior to the second quarter, uh, because we want to make sure you have the funding you need, obviously. Uh, but we, we don't know. I personally wouldn't have a clue what a nurse one-to-one -one ed tech would be um, or what the cost would be. So if you do have instances of students where you already know that you're going to have additional costs that are already over what is a normal uh, special education placement. Um, gather that information, send it to us through Jennifer, um, 
so that we can all get together and discuss it and determine uh, what we can do to assist with the additional funding needs that you might have early on. <clears throat> Get that to us as soon as you can. Um, I think teacher salary. So Lisa was asking if it's okay to uh, allocate teacher salary by percentage of students with IEP. I think that makes sense. So if you have a blended classroom, uh, pre-K classroom, and you've got uh, special aid, special ed students within the classroom, and then you've also got regular, I think I think allocating the teacher salary by percentage of students with IEP makes perfect sense. Um, what else? Anything else? Give it to me. I'm ready. I got my coffee. Coffee. It's too late for coffee. Beth, you have a question. Go ahead. Never, never too late for coffee. <laughs> yeah, I, I asked this last week, but I don't know if I asked it correctly, Erin. Um, you know, our district, you know, we've got a lot of private pre-Ks in town here. If we have a student who's attending a private pre-K in York, but they are from South Berwick, uh, are they considered within our uh, catchment area as a preschool student for evaluation? Not, no, not at this at this point. So you're talking about in that scenario, if they were school age, you would cover that with an ISP. Correct. Um, that's Just a great question, Beth. And I'm going to. Um, Certainly let you know that you don't have a FAPE obligation, but I will get back to you on whether or not you have a child find obligation there. Okay, that's that's where it gets murky for us in York, just because we have so many yes. kids come in from other districts to attend the private pre case here, similar to how they attend school age at Brixham and the programs in town. So I believe the law only applies that particular um user section only applies to school age pre, uh, private schools, but I will um, review user and get back to you. Okay, perfect. And, That's the, yeah. the, we thought, whoever I was speaking with last week thought that was the direction we were going in, but I just wanted clarification because we have so many students who, especially since we're one of the few in York County, they're probably going to, we'll, we'll probably have knocks on our door for that. And I just want to make sure that we know exactly how to proceed. Okay, perfect. Hold one second, please. Okay, the question I wanted to answer was from Leanne. Um, there are in public, in chapter 124, there's a 10 hour requirement for preschool, a 10 hour requirement. This is where Muser and chapter 124 conflict because for four-year-olds, the FAPE obligation is nine hours, but the general ed offering is 10 hours recommended through chapter 124. Now, those of you who have been in these conversations know that whatever you offer general education students is what you offer special education students. So um, that does kind of trump users nine hours because if you're offering at least a 10 hour program, then you have to offer that to your students with disabilities as well. There is no requirement for amount of hours beyond that 10 hour preschool 124 requirement. Most folks on this call are considering a half day program or a full day program. So those are, that would be a 15 hour versus a 30 hour or 32 hour program, depending on what your, um, if you're going to align that with your school age population but there's no requirement other than that 10 hours in 124 um, that you have to work around. I think there are a number of you that are doing full days and I think there's a number of you that are doing half days. It's, it's um, not consistent. I mean, it's not, no, not everybody's doing the same thing. Yes, Beth, go ahead. I promise not to be the only person that asks all these questions. <laughs> okay. It's a so great question. We're offering two public pre-K classrooms that are general education, and we have completed the guidelines for enrollment matching the profile of the district. So we have about 22% of the enrollment of those two classrooms being special ed. But so we, 
we won't be held to that standard for let's say a child who's attending a private pre-K in town and we're supporting their SDI in that setting. We won't be held to our own standard of 30 hours, correct? I, I have to get back to you on that because um, our consultant, Suze Perry, he's a former 619 coordinator in Arizona. Um, there is some national um, precedent for providing special education service or standalone service um, as a FAPE obligation. Um, so I, not a FAPE obligation, but as a requirement for 619. So I think that um, when I was first thinking about this, Beth, I was thinking that you would have to um, provide the equivalent at a child care. But I think we're going to be working on seeing if there is, you know, potentially what you might do is, for instance, offer, let's say, the general education equivalent. Let's say it's $10,000, the EPS funding formula for the four and three year olds in your, in your SAU. Then you can say to child care center C, you know, here's $10,000 educational programming. We're going to be applying some special education to this so that they can have access to this program. It could be that that is the general <laughs> education equivalent, but we're still trying to map that out. And we're thinking about that. Um, so it's, it's really about me working with Susie and even some of our technical assistance partners and OSEP to make sure that we say, you know, that we can just provide you with speech language and your child care, and that's all we need to do. So that's um, what we're trying to determine at this point. We want to make sure that we're meeting federal requirements. We know the federal government knows we're not meeting the FAPE obligation, and they're going to be very focused on 619 when they come to monitor us. So um, I'm going to defer that question, but, but we are going trying to get that answer currently. Thank you. I'm gonna unmute. I wrote a, a response in the chat, uh, but Lisa, you said, but our budget is in general fund. Budget upload will be late. This is not supposed to be in general fund. That's why we've given you new codes, 2213. General fund is 1000. This is why it's important that for this purposes of this cohort, one, pre-K pre special ed, it's 2213, not 1000. It is not general fund. Just okay. for your special ed folks, Lisa, not for your general ed four-year-olds and five-year-olds. Just for the special ed, so you need to separate them out, which is where the question about the percentage of student staff comes in. Because if you do have a blended room, classroom, which is fine, you're gonna need to split it out according to some, some determination, which percentage of IEP students makes sense to me. Lisa, does that help? I don't see you, so I can't read your face. All right, so we're gonna close out this meeting. Um, I'm gonna update the document that I gave you, that I reviewed with you, and I'm gonna add a little bit more to part C transition. I'll send that out to you. Remember next week, we're not meeting. Next week is a holiday. No one should be working and uh, go, go do something fun. And But by the end of this week, we're gonna start reaching out to connect with you on those one-on-one -on -one meetings to do your MOUs. And, and start that conversation. And that would be the initial conversation. We don't, we're not gonna have, and again, these are agreements that can be modified at any time, but we're going to do our best guess at how we wanna start this relationship. And especially for child time and the transition from C to B, we have to really, really be clear on who's doing what so that we don't have anyone fall through the cracks because that's the most important thing that we wanna make sure. So um, thank you everyone for coming. We'll send out this recording and have a lovely evening. Have a good flight. Thanks. <laughs>